with the RX-78 II wreaking havoc upon the Xeon forces, it should come as no surprise that it became the center of attention for the Federation engineers. Mere instance after its first deployment, it became a symbol of victory for the Federation and a source of fear for Xeon. But this didn't mean that the Gundam was without its flaws, or so the engineers thought. The Gundam was mainly developed as a close combat mobile suit that was also versatile enough to serve as a mid-range unit. But in order to achieve this, certain trade-offs did have to be made. The most important things were its mobility and the revolutionary beam weapons, resulting in two compromises that both limited its operational time. One, it only had a limited amount of onboard fuel, and two, the beam weapons were very energy hungry. And so began the Federation's quest of turning the Gundam into something that it wasn't, because if it ain't broke, over-engineer it. One idea to give the Gundam more oomph was the full armor project, which we'll talk about later in another video, and the other was the G fighter program. The main idea with the latter was to create a support fighter that could either dock with the Gundam or serve as a sub-flight system to circumvent its limited fuel and also to have its own built-in weaponry to support the Gundam's own arsenal. And the result was a very blocky fighter tank thing that was somewhat ready for deployment after two months of development, and two of these monstrosities were rushed to the wide base in such a hurry that they didn't even come with a complete manual. So the folks on board of the wide base just had to kind of figure out what they could do with these flying bricks as they went along. Because at the very least, there was some reason to the madness as to why the G-Fighter was such a big and bulky thing. It was made to incorporate the entire Gundam and to transform it into different configurations. And one of the more popular configurations was known as the G-Armor, sometimes also called the G-Full because it used all of the parts of the Gundam and also all of the parts of the G-Fighter. So to achieve this mode, the G-Fighter can split into two halves. The front half, also called the A-Parts, which consists of the cockpit, nose-mounted twin missile launcher and a pair of twin mega particle cannons, of which three types are known to have been developed, but it's unsure what exactly the differences between them are, and the back half, also called the B-Parts. And this consisted of the thrusters and a rear-facing 4 tube missile launcher. Although, sometimes it's also shown to have a forwards-facing missile launcher. These halves then encapsulated the Gundam, turning it into a 120-ton fighter-bomber thingy that, according to one source, could reach Mach 3.5. What? What the fuck? To put that into perspective, the F-14 had an advertised maximum speed of Mach 2.34, and even today it is still considered a very speedy plane. I think that it's best to disregard that source and talk about the more realistic aspects of this flying box. When combined into the G-Armor mode, this amalgamation of parts could be controlled by either the pilot of the Gundam or the pilot of the G-Fighter, and in order to improve both its defensive capabilities and its flight characteristics, a second 10-ton shield was attached to the Gundam's right arm. But this then proved to be a slight issue when the Gundam separated from the G-Fighter during combat, which was an action known as Bolt Out. Amuro liked having his Gundam with just a shield on its left arm, so that second shield was dropped whenever the Gundam bolted out, something that it would almost always have to do when the fighting got tough. So this was quite a waste. The obvious answer? 
over-engineer it even harder. Rather than simply keeping the shield on the right arm or storing it on the backpack, both options that the Gundam was designed for straight out of the gate, the white base engineers would spend precious time and resources developing a special joint that would allow for that second shield to be placed over the first shield. Also, uh, when the Gundam did the bolt out maneuver, the computer would take over control of the A part and the B part to recombine them into the standard G fighter. The other two intended combinations then were an even more mixed bag. The G bull was a tank like thingy that was achieved by having the A parts combined with the Gundam's top half and a core fighter. And the G Sky was a fighter that was achieved by having the B parts combined with the Gundam's bottom half and also a core fighter. Essentially, this was a supercharged version of the core fighter intended for high speed combat and long range operations. But both of these transformations suffered from the same glaring problem. They both required a part of the Gundam and, in practice, were less useful than the alternative, the G armor or the Gundam and G fighter by themselves. So realistically speaking, they were really only stopgap modes for when the main modes weren't possible due to damage or something. Still, the wide base engineers did try to solve some of the problems with these two modes. They figured out that they could simply not use the Gundam's parts. Sometimes my genius is... it's almost frightening. The G-Sky became the G-Sky Easy, and instead of using the Gundam's legs to connect the core fighter to the B parts, it now just had a standard connector piece installed. And the G-Bull became the G-Bull Easy. A very hollow tank that was completely exposed from behind. And the G-Bull Easy suffered from another drawback that the G-Fighter also suffered from. When connected to the Gundam, the reactor of the Gundam gets connected to the reactor of the A parts, and therefore giving the cannon more power. Therefore, the G Bull with the Gundam's torso was more powerful than the G Bull Easy without the Gundam's torso. But I think that is a small sacrifice to make to also be able to use the Gundam. The final configuration then was somewhat of a battlefield modification, because in order to compete with Xeon's high-speed mobile armors, Amuro came up with the idea of outfitting the Gundam with only the B parts, giving it a huge speed boost and basically turning it into a mock mobile armor itself. And as an added benefit, the Gundam could still easily use all of its handheld weaponry and bolting out of this configuration was also significantly faster. This mode was referred to as the Gundam Sky or the Gundam Mobile Armor mode or simply the Gundam Plus B parts. Still, the most commonly used configuration and also the most successful one was just the Gundam by itself and the G Fighter by itself. The G Fighter could provide backup for the Gundam and it was also sturdy enough to act as a subflight system for the Gundam, pretty much making the G armor transformation pointless. And this really could be seen in the post war. Dedicated subflight systems were widely used and incredibly successful, whereas G armor esque combinations were few and far in between, and even less of them were deemed a success. Also, the G Fighter is sometimes called the G Mecha, standing for Gundam Multiple Expansion Changeable Armaments, or the G Parts, standing for Gundam Practical Advanced Research for Tactical Systems. But now, before we move on to the developments of the G Fighter, we first have to tackle the elephant in the room. Did this thing even really exist in the first place? because conflicting reports exist surrounding it. The story that I've told you so far is how it was first said to have happened. 
but later on, records popped up that the G-Fighter was never actually used by the white base and that it got two core boosters instead. And later documents do seem to agree with this notion. The G-Fighter was not on the white base. And like I just said, some people have even claimed that the G-Fighter never existed at all and that it was nothing more than a marketing ploy by a toy company to capitalize on the success of the RX-182 and to sell more action figures based on it. But putting that theory aside, this leaves us with two options. Either we accept that the G-Fighter never existed and end the video right now, or we go with a slightly different timeline for which we also do have some evidence. The first is that we do have some other, albeit unconfirmed sightings of the G-Fighter. And the second one actually has to do with that core booster that seemingly replaced the G-Fighter. For its development, data gathered by the G-Sky was used, indicating that it did exist, but it might have simply existed much earlier than the initial story led us to believe. So I would argue that the G-Fighter wasn't developed based on the Gundam's combat data, but that it was developed alongside the Gundam and completed at roughly the same time. In fact, in Gundam Mobile Suit Variations, it's said that it's rumored that the development of the G-Fighter even began as soon as it was decided to use a core block system for the Project V machines, meaning that it is, again, perfectly reasonable to assume that the G-Fighter was finished alongside the Gundam and was tested out before the events of the anime. Which then leads to two of my personal theories. Either the G-Fighter was shipped to Site 7 along with the rest of the Project V machines and then unfortunately destroyed off-screen by the Xeon attack, or they remained at Jawbro for further testing. Because we know that the following variants were developed and underwent testing there. So, on to those variants. At some point in the development of the original G-Fighter, the Federation realized something crazy about it. It was able to carry a 60-ton mobile suit and was still remarkably agile. So what if instead of a mobile suit, they used it to deliver 60 tons of bombs instead? And so the G-Fighter bomber type was born. With the main difference from the regular G-Fighter being that the Gundam storage compartment was now replaced by a bomb bay that could also hold extra fuel tanks for long-range bombing missions. Other changes were a pair of Vulcan guns mounted to the side pods, the twin Mega Particle Cannon was now replaced by a weapon hardpoint for which multiple weapons were supposedly available, but we only know about a twin 2-2 missile launcher, and the Caterpillar threats that had no business being on a fighter in the first place were now removed. What remained unchanged then was the rest of its frame, and therefore also the nose-mounted twin missile launcher. Because the bomber type was developed so late into the war though, only 8 units would be produced, but they did actively participate in combat. Next up we have the G-Fighter's space type, and just like the bomber type, this unit would see some major improvements to make it better at its designated role, this time a space fighter. So the main thrusters were upgraded and the caterpillar treads replaced by more thrusters. And in terms of weaponry, it kept the nose-mounted twin missile launchers, the twin mega particle cannon behind the cockpit was replaced with a double three-tube missile launcher, mega particle cannons were installed on the wings, and the space to store the Gundam was now turned into a optional weapons bay. Which was also the reason why the space type featured a double-seater cockpit. There's the main pilot and a gunner dedicated to operating that weapons bay. But by removing that weapons bay, the space type could still be used to store the Gundam or a similarly sized mobile suit. And again, like the bomber type, because it was introduced so late into the war, only a small number of these units would be produced and deployed. However, 
it would prove to be successful enough to be further developed after the One Year War. Thanks to the bomber type and the space type, the Federation realized that the G fighter could tackle a variety of different missions by utilizing the empty space reserved for the Gundam. This concept would be further developed into the G fighter assault landing type, and instead of a weapons bay, it was now made to house what was essentially an APC. The vehicle could house 30 soldiers and had built-in thrusters for a smooth landing. And these were especially important considering the fact that there was only one way for the APC to be deployed. The assault landing type would split apart and simply ditch the APC. After this, the fighter could provide close fire support for the troops thanks to its rocket launchers and bunker busters. The assault landing type would first see the light of day in UC-0080, but thanks to its versatile nature, it would see a long service life and was used a lot by the Federation Special Forces. Its only downside was its high fuel consumption, meaning that long flights were impossible. And finally, we get to the manga and magazine-only variants of the G-Fighter, so make of their canonical status what you want. For example, the G-Fighter 2 that appeared in Gundam 0083 Rebellion. After the failure of the original G-Fighter, the Federation forces apparently thought that it was a great idea to make a version 2.0 that barely fixed any of the problems of the original. Essentially, it was just a revamped G-Fighter made to work with the GPO-1 and some minor quality of life upgrades. It featured a twin-seater cockpit, the A and B parts were connected to each other thanks to a telescoping arm, and it had a more traditional landing gear instead of the caterpillar treads. Another slightly revamped version of the G-Fighter was the General Purpose G-Fighter from the Gundam 0079 manga. And even though it might look very different from the G-Fighter of the anime, the manga uses a very different design for that original G-Fighter. And the story for this general purpose version seems to be very similar to that of the space type and the bomber type. It was a mass production version of the original, and by sacrificing the Gundam's loading compartment, it could now be outfitted with much more weapons, like two heavy anti-base missiles and anti-ship Faust missiles, it now got a two-seater cockpit, presumably for one pilot and one gunner, and the main thrusters were upgraded. And again, just like the space type, by removing that new weapons bay, a mobile suit could still be stored inside of it. So I would personally classify them as like alternate universe versions of each other. Taking a very different approach then was the Super G armor from Gundam Wars Project Zeta. While most G-Fighter developments got rid of the ability to dock with the Gundam, the Super G-Armor's goal was to become a more dedicated fighter while retaining that ability to store a Gundam, or a similar mobile suit. To achieve this, the docking mechanism was simplified as much as possible. Instead of separating into A and B parts, the Super G armor's nose had a sliding mechanism for easier ejection and docking. Weaponry then remained mostly the same, with two mega particle cannons and rocket launcher pods that could be mounted underneath the wings and underneath the fuselage. It could also be outfitted with a booster unit to increase its operational time and range. While a prototype version most likely existed, the project never made it to mass production, before it was scrapped at some point after the One Year War. I speculate that the emergence of subflight systems like the Base Jabber and the Dodai Kai had something to do with this. And for our last entry, we go all the way back to the beginning. The prototype G-Fighter, which appeared in the MSVR Shin Matsunaga manga. At some point during the V project, the idea came up to create a heavy space fighter with the same type of generator and weapons that they were using to outfit their mobile suits with. 
it was then decided to turn it into a proof of concept for the transformation idea that would lead to the G Fighter that we now all know and either love or hate. The prototype consisted of three different modules that could combine into the V Fighter or could be used individually with a pilot in each module. The G Shrike was the nose and was only armed with a quadruple Vulcan gun. The G Ignis was the top rear half and had a cockpit that was very similar to that of the Core Fighter, the same 15 caliber cannons as the Ball Type K, and a quad missile launcher on each wing. And then finally, the G Atlas was the bottom rear half and had two powerful Mega Particle cannons and Caterpillar treads that allowed it to act as a high speed combat vehicle. And later on, the Ignis module would be combined with the Jim Intercept Custom, creating the Jim Intercept Custom Ignis. And that was all for the development history of the G Fighter slash G Armor slash G Mecha slash G Parts. A toy like fighter plane that may or may not have existed in the Gundam universe. So let me know down below. What do you think about this flying brick? Do you accept its existence or do you go with the Gundam compilation movies and replace it with the Core Booster? Personally, I've always been firmly in camp Core Booster, but I do like the theory that I came up with in this video to incorporate them both into the same universe, so maybe I'll make that my new headcanon. But anyways. As always, a big thank you to the Patreon supporters. I hope everyone watching has a great day, and I'll see you all next time.